please. <laughs> Before direct dialing, that's what customers heard when they picked up their telephone receiver. The pleasant voice of a female operator on the telephone company switchboard. But this was not always the case. In fact, the first switchboard operators were boys, some as young as 13 years old. When the first telephone exchanges opened in 1878, boys on the switchboard seemed a natural choice. After all, telegraph operators were males. Boys could not only connect calls, they could also be sent out to repair lines, just like telegraph operators. There was, however, one significant difference between the two jobs that few considered at the time. Telegraph operators didn't have to speak to customers, but telephone operators did. And this turned out to be a problem. Some teenage boys were less than delicate when it came to dealing with frustrated customers. There were more than a few colorful exchanges, and some boys were easily bored. Pranks were common, and not just on each other. Customers were frequently involved. Whatever the cause, male domination over switchboards didn't last a year. On September 1st, 1878, Emma Nutt of Boston became the first female operator. Her sister was hired a few hours later. To say they performed well and made an impression would be an understatement. By 1938, when the film Operator was produced, AT&T's Bell System had 115,000 female operators, and company projections anticipated the need to train and employ 25,000 new girls each year to keep pace with demand. Male operators were essentially absent from the scene by then, and they didn't return until the early 1970s, when federal laws demanded equal opportunity in the workplace. This film is a relic that I think you will enjoy, a trip back in time to the all-girl world of a 1930s operator. For 50 years, there has been a voice in America that has come to signify in fullest measure the womanly virtues of devotion, helpfulness, sympathy, patience. Ever since, a half a century ago, young women became the guardians of a service destined to make a neighborhood of the nation. This voice has been a courteous one, a friendly one, alert and intelligent. Today, it is a universal voice. The voice of operators of telephone switchboards who day and night are weaving the fabric of the nation's speech. Hardly an individual in the length and breadth of the land has not heard this voice who does not depend upon these helpful public servants, more than 100,000 strong, who wait our summons, respond to our demands, guide our eager speech to neighboring homes and shops or farms and cities far away or lands beyond the seas who bring to our ears off straining with suspense some vital news, some loving word, perhaps the answer to a prayer. There are times when the press rings with the praise of these young women, when writers tell of their accomplishments with the deepest emotion, when communities thrill to recognition and honor that have come to their daughters for steadfastness and sacrifice. Yes, there is no higher type of woman service than that which we expect so confidently in routine or emergency from these devoted groups whose skilled ability gives pulsing life to the mechanisms in their charge. Whence comes that ability is a most interesting question. And in the scenes that follow, you may perhaps find the answer. They will suggest some of the influences that combine to make an operator that unite in developing not only a manual skill, but a point of view. These influences are at work long before we first hear her number, please. Nor are they confined to training alone. If we follow the experiences of an applicant for membership in this honored profession, we find that the making of an operator starts with the most important responsibility, selection.
Listen for a moment. How did you become interested in operating work, Miss Bradley? Well, one of my best friends is an operator. She started working for the telephone company three years ago. I suppose she's told you a lot about her work. She likes it so much she's always talking about it. And about the nice friends she's made here. I noticed from your application you graduated from high school last June. That's right, Miss Rogers. In fact, it was the principal, Mr. Watkins, who first gave me the idea of applying. He thinks I'm well fitted for the work. And uh, how does your mother feel about it? Oh, she's encouraged me to apply ever since I told her I wanted to be an operator. With the applicant complete at her ease because of the friendly interest of her questioner, the interview continues. For there is much more besides biographical data to be discovered and recorded. Important information can be brought forth by skillful questioning and observation. For example, during the reading test, the speech of the applicant also provides a voice test under the most natural conditions. The experience of Augustus added weight to these salutary reflections and effectually convinced him. Thank you, Miss Bradley. Now, I suppose you know we rely on our employees to be regular and punctual in their attendance. Yes, I live only a short distance from the office and would have no trouble in getting here on time. And I had a very good attendance record at school. As to working hours, are you willing to work evening hours? Yes, and also on Sundays and holidays when necessary. My friend told me all about that, and also about your vacation plan and all the other things you do for your employees. And I presume, Miss Bradley, you know it's customary for applicants to have a physical examination? Yes, I do, and I'll be glad to take it at any time. That's fine. Now, we'll let you know about the date and time. We have many applications, but only a few vacancies. I believe, however, we should give you further consideration. And I hope we'll be able to offer you a position as operator. And you'll let me know soon? Just as soon as we can, Miss Bradley. Thank you, Miss Rogers. The physical examination is simple. Just enough to make sure there is no physical reason why the applicant could not or should not make the profession of switchboard operation her career. It is all part of that important responsibility, selection. Height and weight are recorded. Heart, lungs, nose, throat are checked. General physical condition is noted and the details entered in the medical department records. And then comes the day, and the most important day it is for any young woman starting her business life, when she actually enters upon her employment. It is the day when she reports to her chief operator for the careful, considerate training that precedes her regular operating duties. And here's for the first time the arresting chorus of the operating room the voice of the switchboard, as it answers the voice of the city. Judging from your record at high school, you won't have any trouble learning, Miss Bradley. An instructor will teach you, and you won't handle actual calls until you can do so accurately and quickly. That is a relief. I was afraid I might have to start with real calls. Oh, don't worry. You'll have so many practice calls, you'll be a good operator before you're given a regular position at the switchboard. Oh, uh, here comes your instructor now. This is Miss Molly Bradley, Miss Jane. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Jane? Miss Bradley is ready to begin her training. I'm going to be interested in your progress, and I'll see you often. But I want you to feel free to come and see me whenever you want to. Thank you, Miss Morgan. I appreciate that. Come, I'll get you a locker and show you the building before we look at the switchboard. Thank you. I had no idea a switchboard was so large. Yes, it is a large board. You see, all of the telephones with feeder numbers are connected to it. When a light flashes, it indicates that a customer has lifted his receiver and wants to make a call. There are other boards for other purposes, but you will first operate at this board. You know, Miss Jane, this is really the first time I've seen a switchboard. Is it always so busy? Oh, no, not always. This just happens to be our busiest hour when we need lots of operators. How will I ever learn to work? It won't be so hard to learn. We'll talk about the various calls you'll have to handle. After each talk, you'll have a period of practice. You mean, I'll take calls right at the switchboard? Yes, but they'll just be practice calls, not actual customer calls. Oh, you'll sit at a practice position between two regular operators. 
And when I've had enough practice, do I start on regular calls? Exactly. For a short time each day. Then we'll slowly extend the time until you're ready for regular work. Oh, I think I like that way of learning. It's sort of, well, sort of gradual. It's one of the advantages of our method of training. And now suppose we try it. And so starts the first day of a most important period in the making of a telephone operator. Trained under the chief operator, who later will watch and direct her work, the beginner is enabled to absorb the atmosphere and the methods of the actual central office that is to be her business home. There is much to learn, but the training system is carefully planned and carefully paced to afford the maximum amount of practice after each type of call has been explained and discussed. In fact, the fundamental philosophy is learning by doing. And so as the days of training pass, the student spends most of the time at a practice position, which is a position actually occupied by a regular operator during busy hours. For practice purposes, it is connected with another position nearby where a special operator can pass calls to the student that will simulate actual customer calls. It is here, with her instructor close at hand to observe and direct, and with busy operators on either side to inspire and encourage by their example, that the beginner learns in every detail by doing. Here she starts to gain the poise that will mark her future service. Here, her handling of cords, plugs and keys steadily improves with her increasing knowledge of the public's needs. It is supervised practice in the actual environment of our future task, a highly sensible and practical method of developing the coordination of hand and head that distinguishes these young women everywhere. Finally, she is ready to merge her voice with a 100,000 others to become part of that invisible agency to which we are accustomed to turn with so much trust. She is ready for service. Well, Miss Bradley, do you feel you're ready to take over a regular position at the board? Yes, Miss Jennings, I think I'm ready. So do I. And so does the chief operator, Miss Morgan. That's why I've asked Miss Lewis to join us. She will be your supervisor at the switchboard. Oh, I'm glad to know that. I'll try very hard, Miss Lewis. I'm sure you will, Miss Bradley. Miss Lewis will give you any additional instruction or practice you may need. And don't hesitate to ask questions. You'll find there's always something to be learned. And we'll help you all we can. Of course we'll help. We all will. You know, you're one of the crowd now, Miss Bradley. Well, you've all been so kind and helpful. I've enjoyed every minute of the training. You're going to like the regular work even more. Now about tomorrow, Miss Bradley. When you report for duty, take position number 21. That will be your regular assignment. And don't forget, I'll be there to help if you need me. Good luck, Miss Bradley. you've come to see our central office, Mrs. Bradley. You know, we like to have the mothers visit us. Molly was so enthusiastic about her work, I had to see for myself. <laughs> You'd be surprised if you knew how well I've educated her, Miss Morgan. She answers the telephone promptly. She talks distinctly. She never lets the cord get twisted. Oh, really, she's become an ideal telephone user. Well, you know, Mrs. Bradley, good telephone service is something that depends on both sides. We do our best, but a lot depends on how the telephone is used. I realize that now, Miss Morgan. Will it be all right if I show Mother around the office before I go on duty? Why, of course. Go right ahead. I'll see you again before you leave. Thank you, Miss Morgan. Mm -hmm. Come, Mother. I'll put my things away first. This is our locker room.
recreation room for the period when we're off duty. Sounds more like recreation than rest to me. <laughs> oh, that's some of the girls rehearsing for our show. You know, for our Christmas party to raise money for poor girls and boys. Oh, yes, you told me about it. The girls come early several times a week and rehearse before going on duty. Let's go in. Well, that wasn't so bad, but there are still several ragged spots. Let's try it again, shall we? Okay. Where's the Wait, it's Molly and her mother. Hello. 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 How's the act coming along? Oh, slow but sure, Molly. We were just trying to smooth out the song a bit. I thought it sounded pretty good. What's the name of it? With a song in my heart is the title. It's a well-known song. Listen. <laughs> We've written new words to it. And ours we call, With a Smile in My Voice. With a song in my heart. With a smile in my voice. I guess they both mean the same thing, don't they? <laughs> well, I'll be at the show to hear you sing it. Bye. 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 It's attractive. We even have our own library. Really? Oh, Mother, here's a picture of our last year's Christmas party. The children must have grand times at those Christmas parties. Yes, but the girls enjoy them as much as the kids do. interesting an operating room sound. Well, you may notice it, Mother, but we're so used to it, we don't even hear it. And all those little lights twinkle just like stars. There seem to be as many, too. Every one means a telephone call to be made. They go out when the operator plugs into the line and says, number, please? Come on over here, Mother, to a vacant position. I'll show you something about the work. Here we are. Now, the first thing I do is put on my telephone set. I say, no, wait. Better yet, you put it on, Mother. Oh, no, Molly. I don't want to do that. Oh, come on, Mother. I want you to know how it feels to wear an operator set. Take off your hat. Get down. Hold it. Right. Why, this is light. I thought they were much heavier. There. Now, when a customer picks up the telephone, a lamplight at the place on the board where the line comes in, the first thing the operator does is to take a cord like this one and put the plug in the small opening above the light. That seems simple enough. Next, she moves this lever, which we call a key, so the customer can hear her. I know what comes next. Number, please. Am I right? You're right, Mother. Now, after she has received the number, she makes the connection with the front course. What? <laughs> I'm giving you the very first lesson I had myself. But suppose you get an emergency call, say for the fire department. What do you do then? See this special bulletin? Yes. Well, there's one just like it before every operator, so that no time is lost in completing the emergency call. When she gets an emergency call for the fire department, the police, or an ambulance, she knows at a glance what number to call. I thought you must have some arrangement like that. Emergency calls get special treatment. An operator won't handle any other calls until she has completed the emergency call. And her supervisor always stands ready to assist her. For example, while waiting for the fire department to answer, she asks where to send the apparatus in case the calling party should leave the telephone. I see. Now, here's how I make a call to a mother sent to Lawson. I brought Mother back to say goodbye, Miss Morgan. I go on duty in a moment. Did you show your mother everything? We didn't miss anything. She wanted to see it all. Of course I did. I must go now. I'm on duty Sunday, and I want to pick up my schedule of hours from the central office clerk. And run along then, Molly. You'll be home at the usual time? Yes, unless there's an emergency. Thank you for letting Mother look around, Miss Morgan. Bye. She's a pretty good daughter, Miss Morgan. And she's a good telephone operator, too. I hope so. It's such important work. 
Well, Molly learned very quickly. Her technique is splendid. I'm glad to hear you say that. Yes, she does very well. But just knowing how to operate isn't what makes a good operator. It's a real desire to be of service. And Molly's shown that from the very beginning. I think she always will. She's a good operator now, but she's going to be a better one. We've taught her how to operate, and the rest of the training comes from the people who use the service. It's the daily work that really makes an operator, the trains the right kind of girl, Molly's kind. Why, that's true. It's work itself that really teaches. I think that's something that all mothers can understand. 